And I'm going to tell you that you're being recorded for legal reasons, of course. Okay, and, perfect. And I'll start. Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Professional Novice with Ali Rizvi. This is a, a podcast that I started. It's just, you know, we are all learning all the time. Um, so we are all novices and I like uh, being in that state. Uh, at a permit level, and I like bringing people on who um, are experts, who people who I really respect in terms of uh, their ideas and their thoughts. And uh, today is obviously no exception. Uh, no exception. Um, mm -hmm. uh, today we will be speaking with uh, one of my heroes, uh, Mariam Namazi. Oh. Um, so uh, Mariam Namazi is uh, a British Iranian secularist and human rights activist. Uh, she's often credited for making the ex-Muslim movement. Um, the global phenomenon that it is today. Uh, and so she has had, uh, you know, she started, launched a council, uh, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain in 2007. Um, and I think the first time I saw you, Mariam, was at a conference in, I don't think you remember, but it was a conference uh, here in Toronto. Uh, and I was in the audience and I asked you a question. I was completely in awe. So oh, brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, I think it was back then, and I was just doing this. I was very, very inspired. There were very few people openly talking about it, and you were one of them. So uh, you've been a hero of mine ever since. Oh, thank you. Well, we've there's so many of us now, so uh, inspiring lots of uh, new generations of people, which is great. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Uh, but today, what we're talking about, we're moving away mm -hmm. from. I mean, I guess this is connected to ex-Muslim issues as well. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the protests that you're seeing today. Uh, so the murder of George Floyd, um, as uh, everybody knows now recently, um, triggered a, a range of protests that are that are not just in the US anymore, but they're worldwide. And uh, they've actually sparked a lot of passionate conversations, not only among the black community, but also within many marginalized communities uh, about oppression, about systems of oppression, whether they exist, how insidious they are. Um, and how do we detect them, especially in this day and age? So uh, Mariam, I think, is, is the perfect person uh, to talk to about this. Uh, one thing I want to start with is that like everybody, um, like all the other groups, there has been debate on this. You know, some people are saying systemic, systemic racism is real. Others are saying it's not. And this is certainly true also in the ex-Muslim community. Uh, a lot of my friends, close friends of mine in the ex-Muslim community, disagree with me on this. They don't think there's any evidence of systemic racism. And um, we're going to get into the stats and the data on this a little bit, uh, but uh, the, one of the things that they quote the most is they quote studies about police shootings. And I want to drive home the point that George Floyd wasn't shot, right? Eric Gardner wasn't shot. Freddie Gray wasn't shot. Uh, these were not police shootings. Um, and I can't breathe, the slogan, I can't breathe, which is being seen with Black Lives Matter all over the place now, um, is not about shootings. This is, so we have to zoom out from this narrow focus of shootings and really talk about um, what is systemic, the overall system, uh, and all, all of the different ways that it does manifest itself um, in these incidents. So, so we will get into that, and that will obviously include uh, the killings and the shootings as well. But First of all, Mariam, uh, thank you for coming on. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you have also had a personal experience with the NY NYPD of police brutality. Uh, we are going to get into that later and talk about it. Uh, but I just wanted to start with some of your initial thoughts about this conversation, the protests, and the, the way the conversation is happening in the ex-Muslim community as well. Well, thank you, Ali, uh, for um, organizing this. I think this is a hugely important uh, discussion. I think there are some ex-Muslims that might feel a little um, concerned and, you know, I've heard people worried that there seems to be a polarization in the so-called ex-Muslim community over this issue. And I think that there's nothing to be afraid about. The reality is that we're not a homogenous community any more than the Muslim community is, uh, the black community is, the white community is. Uh, and there are differences of opinions, and I think it boils down, in my opinion, to differences in politics. And I think, uh, it, you know, for me, I saw it very clearly in um, discussions around open borders and refugee rights, discussions around Brexit. And now I think we're seeing it in um, the Black Lives Matter uh, campaign. And um, 
discussions around racism, systematic racism and police brutality. So I think it's important to have these conversations. Um, but for me, you know, my politics is that I side completely with Black Lives Matters. I mean, that doesn't mean I don't have criticisms of certain things. That doesn't mean that um, I take everything, um, you know, without skepticism and without looking at the facts. But I think that uh, you know, uh, systematic racism is an epidemic in the United States and in other countries, and it is impossible to separate that reality for so many people in so many uh, contexts, not just vis-a-vis uh, -vis policing, for example, but in education, in getting mortgages, in getting jobs, in the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. uh, in, and the, um, in the healthcare system, actually. I mean, I'm from the, the healthcare system. I work in the healthcare you. system and uh, there is demonstrated, you know, there's overwhelming evidence of uh, racial bias and we are trained on it uh, regularly. We have trained our residents on it. We've done all kinds of things mm -hmm. um, to address it as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, that is something that, um, you know, you cannot have this discussion without this larger uh, context of what's happening to uh, black uh, men in particular, but black and minorities in general. And I think also there's an added component, which is a class component, you know, what yeah. is happening to poor people, black, white, whatever color, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so I think, you know, these are things that have to be brought into the discussion for it to be a fruitful one, you know. Um, if you're going to, I think statistics are important, of course, you know, and I know that we are, we come from a, a movement that is rationalist in the sense that, you know, science is important, data is important. But I also think that if you only focus on statistics without looking at the larger context and also, not looking at the flaws in statistics, then you're missing the picture, you're missing the point. And it might be okay if that's your politics and you're hiding behind statistics to promote a certain type of politics, it's fine. But if you really are skeptical, then I think you really need to uh, to look at it, um, you know, from all angles. Um, yeah, I, I and I wanted to, this is a really important point that I wanted to talk about uh, is that Again, with a with a background in science uh, and medicine for the last um, few decades, uh, one of the things that we're taught we're taught to look at journal articles and we look at journal articles. But we have specific courses on critical reading. For example, the way that I look at a journal article, any kind of scientific publication, is that I look at the this is my way as I look at the figures first, the charts, and then I read the introduction and the the rest of the, uh, the the sort of the data, the, the discussion, and so on. So there, there are. This is a specific. This is a very key part of of processing any kind of scientific information is to look at it critically, and that's where the whole process of of peer review comes in. And you know, I'll I'll give you an example of this. And of course, statistics and data are the only way we have to eventually get to some sort of objective um, sense of what is happening. But well, here's an example, uh, and I've, I've given this before, that in Sweden, right, Sweden has the highest reported rates of rape in the world. It has the reported rates of rape in Sweden are more than Saudi Arabia and India combined. Now, most of us will look at this data and we won't believe it. And there's a good reason we won't believe it is because we know that uh, reporting rape is, is a stigma. And a lot of times it's being covered up. The data that we're getting from Saudi Arabia and India is often coming from the same establishment right, that is covering up for these crimes. Uh, the Catholic Church is another example. You know, is, is uh, child molestation, is it systemic in the Catholic Church? And they say, well, we have a few bad apples, but what happens to them? The systemic, um, when you look at some kind of systemic bias, you don't just look at the few people who are doing it and how many people are doing it. You look at what happens to those people. Are they charged? I mean, this is child molestation. If it happened in any other company, that would be put away for life. But in this case, they're just moved from one church to another, one location to another, one country to another. Um, that is the problem. Like what happens to these people? They Do they get away with it? Do they just get a slap on the wrist? Do they get punished for it? Those are the, those are the, uh, the elements of this story that actually indicate whether something is systemic or not. Um, and yeah. I mean, and also the thing is that, look, there are many things that cannot be measured in statistics because uh, for whatever reason, um, 
you know, it, there's either a blind spot regarding it, just, just as an example, the ex-Muslim movement, you know. Mm -hmm. When I started the Council of Ex-Muslims in 2007, uh, a Guardian reporter asked me, why are you even doing this? This isn't even an issue. You're just causing problems for no reason, you know. Where, where are the ex-Muslim? Where are the statistics to show that they exist? And I think that partly it's also, you know, that's why campaigns and activism are so important because a lot of the... Um, things that those in power are either hiding or have a blind spot to honor crimes, for example. It, it's it's activism and campaigns and direct action that sort of brings attention to them and then forces, you know, some sort of accountability. Right. And I think if we look at the statistics on police violence as well, I, I don't know if we can go over some of these if yes. that's possible i, I think people are asking for moderation because um, um oh, there's a yeah i i don't have a separate moderator what i can do is i can just kind of ignore i i um, think we can ignore people is is that okay or are people not able to i'm do going that? to actually hide this user okay the, okay so okay. now uh, yeah I, I and i uh, so yeah, I wanted to actually bring up this point. What you said uh, is that you know when we these protests and the importance of them. When you have, uh, you know, a lot of people have said uh, to me, especially that the U.S. is actually one of the least racist countries in the world, and I, I understand that as somebody who is also an immigrant, right? Who is who's come here from places like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, who were, um, you know, where racism is actually much more rampant. The way they treat uh, Indians, the way they treat Pakistanis, the way they treat Filipinos, non-Arabs, uh, you, you can tell. So when you come here, yes, it is one of the least racist countries in the world. Uh, Canada as well. I mean, these are nations of immigrants, and we do appreciate that. But the question is, how did it get that way? Right? The way that it got, that, the way that it became the least, one, of, one of the least racist countries in the world is because of all of these the protests, the kind of things that you're seeing today. And they were a lot bloodier in the past. I mean, there's a whole civil war. There were assassinations of civil rights leaders. Um, the, the, the struggle was much, much more immense. What you're seeing now, a few of these, you know, you want to take these looting incidents and you, you want to make them the face of the movement. I mean, this is nothing compared to the kind of things that have happened in the past. There have been, um, you know, there have been rotten apples all over the place. There have been opportunists, there are people who've taken advantage of the situation, but ultimately, in the long run, this is what brought transformative change. Mm. But and, and go ahead, I'll do the moderation. I'll figure it out. Jeez. Okay. I mean, I, I think um, I, I'm not sure. You know, this conversation of whether this is the U.S. is the least racist country in the world is a very useful one because it is a country uh, where, in our lifetimes, or at least uh, those of us who are older, or in our parents' lifetimes, at least. It is a country that not very long ago, uh, you know, had signs that said no black people allowed in, in uh, diners and restaurants and um, where um, there was segregation and uh, of, of black and white children, for example, where uh, there were Jim Crow laws, um, where, you know, um, a lot of the um, effects of those laws and actually the criminal justice system in the United States is still a, is still in place from that era. So I think one, it's a very recent uh, phenomenon and one that we see its effects still, you know, the, the segregation in schools, for example, my, my, my sister is a teacher in a public school in Yonkers, mm -hmm. you know, most of the children, poor, black and minority, uh, the lack of resources for those kids, you know, the fact that that segregation still exists, even if it's not in, in law, very often in practice, it, it continues. And so I think even if there are other countries that are more racist, that's, you know, really not the point. It's sort of like the argument when we talk about ex-Muslims and the right of apostates, we're told that, well, look at US imperialism. And I think we can be opposed to racism in Saudi Arabia, as well as in the United States, because if we Absolutely. are opposed to racism, then it is opposed to racism everywhere, not just to those we like. You know, we're, we're going to focus on racism in Saudi Arabia because we're ex-Muslims and ignore racism in the United States, you know, and, and that yeah. just seems really the wrong way to do things. Um, I think Angela Davis, who's, um, you know, a, a, a long-time activist, you know, she talks about the fact that 
um, the U.S. has never switched into a post-slavery society to figure out how to include people who were kept down. And, and that's why we still see the effects of this racism so clearly. I think it, it's very obvious in the United States. I think people uh, who say that the U.S. is the least racist in the country, the least racist country in the world, really have no idea about what racism means and its, its effects on people's lives. Um, you know, but, uh, and also on the issue of looting, you know, I am, you know, I'm not for looting, but I kind of sort of think that, you know, the British Museum is filled with things that have been looted from Iran, my country, from other countries. Uh, this, a lot of Western Europe, the West was built on looting other countries and continuing to do that. So, you know, I, I think it's, again, you know, the way things are perceived, the criminalization of protest, the attempt to vilify it by um, looking at certain uh, aspects and the, the acts of some people and then sort of generalizing it to an entire movement. And the fact that, you know, when you look at looting, I mean, people running out of shops with food and with shoes, and you kind of think how desperate are these people as well, that, you know, uh, they're using this opportunity to get things that are just basic human needs for people and they don't have access to that. I'm not making an excuse for looting, but I yeah. think it should be looked at in a context as well. It's, it's interesting how the looting those in power do is completely legal and legitimate. And, you know, if if uh, people who are poor and have nothing, nothing, and they constantly have, um, you know, uh, the brutality and the violence of the state meted against them in every aspect of their lives, you know, when they react, uh, you know, it's it's that seen as something a negative, and I think the point is something else, and 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 that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, and but, uh, and just uh, I want to say one thing about the looting that we did see this initially. You know, the first few days when these this is if you look at all kinds of historical events, this is a part of it. Uh, there are uh, people who get angry; they immediately react. Um, everybody who spoke about this, the the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, President Obama, uh, the family of George Floyd, um, celebrities like Killer Mike came out and they denounced the looting. There was there was no question about it. It was unequivocal. People talked about why it was happening, uh, mm -hmm. and eventually it it did die down. And later on, you found that there were opportunistic, you know, there were other groups that were coming in and they were doing this. But you know, it's a in a way, it's it, unfortunately it becomes some people who want to oppose the protest tend mm -hmm. to try to make that. Uh, the face sure. of it and the overwhelming majority of the protesters and i know this people in my family my nephews nieces they've all gone out they've protested the overwhelming majority are peaceful uh also another thing is that when you you know we're talking about police brutality when you look at these videos of the looters it seems like there's no police in sight and mm -hmm. when you see but there's been countless videos of peaceful protesters and peaceful protest by the way is a, is a fundamental first amendment right in the united states but the the police are tear gassing them. It's, it's been seen a lot, and that doesn't really help the cause. You know, and, and, and look, the thing is that uh, look, when you have mass movements and people on the streets, uh, there will be people there who want to take advantage of things, you know, uh, mm. for for their own uh, reasons. We know very well as ex-Muslims that very often our movement, there are attempts by the far right to hijack it. And we're constantly battling uh, that attempt at, at their doing so. So I think it is, you know, a constant, it, it is a reality. Mass movements are messy. Mm. And not everyone is on point because people go to protest because there is a reason why they feel the need to be there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think we need to look at movements on a wide, wider scale. I think the Black Lives Matters movement has brought uh, attention to uh, an epidemic of police violence and state violence against black and minority people in the United States. And what it's done is it has shif shifted culture in the United States. I think we should be celebrating this moment. We are looking at a country that has Trump and honestly, in my opinion, neo-Nazi, you know, people who mm. agree with neo-Nazi ideologies in power, or at least, uh, you know, um, um, 
privileging that that sort of ideology. And we we're dealing with, you know, uh, very right wing policies in Europe as well, whether it's Boris Johnson, whether it's Brexit, the rise of the far right. So to see a people's movement that is against all of these things that have been shoved down our throats is a victory for all of us. And I think that's one of the most important points that I want to bring here is that this is a gain for us because, you know, in the sense when you say Black Lives Matter, it's not saying that other lives are not important, but the reality is that all lives can only matter if Black lives matter, if ex-Muslim yeah. lives matter, and so on. And I think, you know, that's why for me, I think, you know, this is my movement. I'm not an ally. I don't like that term ally. I know Black Lives Matter uh, activists might use it. I have skin in this game. For me, this is my movement. And as I would like them to see ex-Muslim movement as theirs, you know, I. Uh, uh, and I think, in a sense, they've done that because even though we hear misinformation about the Black Lives Movement, you have to judge organizations by their mission. You have to go on their website. There's no such thing as them promoting white um, hate or segregation. I mean, these are things I've heard ex-Muslims say about the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. and it's not true. It's misinformation. But also, I mean, uh, you have to recognize, you know, this moment, the shift that has taken place, not just in the United States, but across the world. You know, we have, um, you know, the NFL and uh, Boris Johnson now talking about a commission uh, about inequality. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon because the narrative has shifted and it's shifted in our favor. And I think we need to recognize these important moments if we're going to build on them and push a movement for equality and human rights forward. Right. Um, I, 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 yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I wanted to actually add to that and say that this is, when you're saying that this is something very different happening, um, it is something very different. You know, when we talk about I, I've heard people talk about how this is, you know, the collapse and everything's chaos and there's no, there's so much discord and, and and what's going to happen from here? Everything's going down the drain. Well, most people don't think so. For the first time, and this is actually incredible uh, for those who've fought, been following this here, 74% of people in the U.S. support, they think that systemic racism exists in policing. 70, out, out of that but this is what's even more amazing, that 53% of Republicans, when people are Republicans, it's Trump's party, think that there's systemic racism. It's uh, incredible. I mean, you've had, and that 53% of Republicans, that's a very, very strong statistics because what have we seen? NASCAR, right, which used to have uh, those Confederate flags at all of their races, yeah. they banned them. There's at least one player, uh, one sort of uh, contestant who has dropped out. He never won any races, I guess. I don't think he was very prominent. But um, the people are up in arms about this, but they're not backing down. There are corporations, um, companies. I mean, I so I work for a digital healthcare agency, and I never really mention them because I don't, you know, I do political work, and you know, I don't want them. I, I know they don't necessarily want to be associated with it, but even they have come up and put out a statement. Ben and Jerry's has put out statements. Uh, and this is something that uh, at least I haven't seen before. I mean, they're talking about getting rid of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a sort of special tier of immunity that's given to police officers where they're, I guess, able to get away with more things um, than the rest of us can. And there is a bipartisan effort to try to get rid of it. So, you know, this is a this is a fight that we're winning. So and, and if any anyone out there who's frustrated by all of the sort of negative rhetoric that you see on on Twitter or, you know, by people who are denying, uh, you know, that that there is any racism here or, we're, you know, talking about other things and deflecting from it, um, just know that f for once, actually, this this movement is gaining ground, not only in the U.S., but but internationally. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I would really like us to talk about statistics, too, because yeah. that is one of the points of contention. But I do also want to say that, uh, you know, if I'm completely frank, I think those who um, use statistics to say that there is no such thing as uh, racism or systematic racism against uh, black people. And in fact, it's actually racism against white people without showing uh, any statistics. I, I think I, I do kind of feel that it's it's hiding behind statistics in order to push forward a certain 
politics. And I think if we're all honest with each other, yeah, we are none of us here are impartial, particularly those of us who are activists. We're not impartial. We're mm -hmm. here to push and push and push for what we think are important in order to bring about social change. The far right does that, the Islamists do that, we're all doing that. Uh, so I think there is a level of dishonesty in hiding behind statistics, if, if we're gonna be completely frank here. And I also feel that the sort of conversations that uh, talk about racism against white people, but don't even recognize that there's racism against black people uh, is, is really, uh, fundamentally because uh, of having bought into white identity politics and white nationalism. And I think that um, it is another form of identity politics that we should know better than anyone uh, when, we, when we're, we're, we're faced with it and to be able mm -hmm. to uh, challenge it in the way that other forms of identity politics has been challenged by ex-Muslims. And I think yeah. we, we can maybe go into that a bit um, further, but if if we can just, if I can yeah. go over some statistics, and I know you have some as well. Right. Um, I mean, I guess the main point I want to make about statistics is that, um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the fact that there's often not statistics about everything. And also I think, and that you can't show a lot of things with statistics, but I think what's really important here is that um, the statistics on police violence is gathered by the police. And I think that's one of the main problems with why there's a problem with statistics. For example, when I was arrested uh, by the NYPD in 1991, I uh, went to protest against the return of the uh, soldiers from the first Gulf War. And I was uh, pulled over, uh, undercover police threw something into the war parade. And the police attacked our, us and basically I was pulled over the barricade. I was uh, a policeman jumped on my stomach. I had internal bleeding. Uh, they kicked me in the face. Um, it, it was a, a, it was a horrible experience. But what happened is, the police charged me and seventeen others. We were called the War Parade Eighteen. They charged us with resisting arrest, with uh, disrupting public order, with attacking the police. A whole lot of um, uh, things that actually would have ended up uh, with. 13 years in prison and we went to court for many years um uh, for several years luckily we, we none of us had money so we had a group of left-wing lawyers who agreed to do uh to advocate on our behalf for free and in fact even when we went into court the police attacked us there and uh, used uh, prot the protesters as batons to open doors and uh, push down the stairs I mean, I think that experience for me opened my eyes in a way that I hope I would have had my eyes open. I hope I would have that sort of empathy, but I'm, I, I don't know because it opened a world for me that I had never ever uh, realized um, that the, the racism and the brutality of, of the, the police. But what I wanna say is that we spent several years going to court and the only reason it was eventually dismissed was because they found video footage from a journalist who was there, and this was many years after, that showed that the police actually attacked us mm. and that we had not resisted arrest, we had not attacked the police, we had not thrown anything. And, you know, if that evidence wasn't there, um, it would have been a different story, possibly, you know, for me, for my life and, and for the others who were in prison. And and this is the reality. If you look at, for example, George Floyd's video, the initial police report said something very different. And that's why it was investigated when the video uh, came out of what had actually happened. If you look at the case of Breonna Taylor, for example, the woman who's, you know, the police rushed into her house, uh, they can enter houses for without knocking and they shot her eight times but the police report said that there were no injuries on her uh you know so and you've got the case of Ahmed um Arbery in Georgia for example where you know he was a young man jogging and a father and a son killed him uh, for two months they were freed and there was no investigation 
because um, they said that um, it, it was an act of self-defense. He, he was there to rob and they were there to stop him. Mm. And after the video came to light, you know, a lots, lots of things changed. And so what I want to say is that because there is this blue shield, because the only witnesses, if there's no video footage, is usually the police, it, it's, it becomes a very different story. So, you know, even when it comes to police killings, this idea that only nine people were innocent is bogus, you know, because the reality is we don't know. And if you, uh, you, you might have heard of this pilot project that took place uh, by the US government itself in, in 2016, there was a project where they decided to count killings by police because one of the things is the statistics are based on what the police every police um uh sends in some police uh, stations will not send this information in so what this um pilot project did was to count killings not just based on data from official reports, but also from open source reports like yes. Guardian, for example. And what they found was that there was actually twice the number of killings by police than had been previously recorded. And uh, so, for example, in 2015, they recorded 270 homicides in three months whereas the FBI had counted 442 homicides in all of 2015. So yeah. what I want to say is that a lot of, um, you know, there a lot of it is based on the fact that th the data is not available because it's not being shared, but also because um, there is this blue shield and the fact that, the, you know, I was reading an article about someone saying that, uh, it, it was about the UK where, um, you know, in, since 1961, there's just been one police officer who's been convicted for their role in the death of someone. And that case, even in that case, the officer received a suspended sentence. And this person was saying in all the years they've been in the criminal justice system, they never found one police officer who will act as a witness against another police officer. And yeah. that's, you know, and I think that's the reality is when you're looking at these statistics, if you really want to be so rational and so skeptical, uh, yeah. then it is important to look at all of these facets as well. Right. And uh, actually, one of the studies uh, that is, uh, quoted by a lot of people is uh, the uh, Harvard study by Fryer, um, which uh, who looked at this sort of police shootings um, um, between blacks and whites, and he found that uh, there was no difference. Even even he found that yet yeah, the police were lo more likely to to rough black people up, mm -hmm. like they're more likely to put their hands on black people, yeah. which is you know something again you know to point out George Floyd, Eric Gardner, these were not people who were shot; they they were roughed up by police. Um, it but it, but it's also, Ali, it's not just roughing up, it's non-lethal force. It is non-lethal force, yeah. Non-lethal force is everything from tasers to being beaten to pulp, you know, to mm -hmm. just you end up being alive. Rodney King, yeah. So, uh, and what happened was one of the biggest critiques of this, I mean, initially when it came out, it wasn't peer reviewed, so that was one of the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the second problem was that all of the information, as you're saying, Mariam, was mm -hmm. from the police departments, mm -hmm. so, or from the FBI. And the FBI, interestingly, actually until only recently, there's an article in the Washington Post by uh, someone who does a lot of work on this, and, and he has a treasure trove of information, Radley Balco. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to put the link to this uh, article in the description, and it's called Why It's Impossible to Calculate the Percentage of Police Shootings that Are Legitimate. And his idea is the same. It's uh, that if you're looking at medical malpractice, if you're looking at hospital errors or mistakes that doctors made, are you going to get all of your information from those doctors' reports, their write-ups, you know, from the hospital's official statements. Are you going to do? No, you're not. Now, you're not going to because it's going to be biased and the hospitals have an economic and just a legal interest in protecting themselves and covering up these stories. Uh, we have seen, Mariam, what, you know, what happened with your story and maybe uh, it, would be, it would help for you to get into sort of more detail of it uh, uh, about your own personal experience. But we saw this with that 75-year-old man who was pushed down to the ground by the police officers in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he started bleeding. 
uh, from his ear, or I think from the back of his skull, and they just kept on walking and ignored him. Um, and they clearly pushed him down in the video, but the official report said, that, no, he tripped, or he just stumbled and fell, and that turned out not to be the case. Uh, and we've seen several instances, like the ones that you described as well. So we have, this is one of the problems with almost all of the studies that are being cited to show that there is no uh, bias is that most of those reports uh, do come from the, the actual official police reports and the FBI, which actually, until recently, only used to keep a record of justifiable killings. Yeah. And they didn't. They, they, they changed that recently. But what they call justifiable, even if they deem something unjustifiable, that is also uh, something that's being a judgment that is being made by the FBI and by the police reports. And this is... Yeah, go ahead. I mean, you know, I find it interesting that uh, there is this discussion that, well, did they resist arrest? As if it justifies killing someone for it, you know, and I think yeah. that, I, I don't know, the tre threshold has become so low and the fact that we've bought into what they say so much that, you know, there is, well, did they have guns or, um, you know, what, what was it? Uh, did they resist arrest or were they, um, you know, was did the police think that uh, they had a reasonable uh, cause to, to shoot people? And the fact that it's just become so normal that they can just kill people and mm -hmm. there's always some excuse and justification for it is, is something that really, I, I guess a lot of it is part of U.S. gun culture as well and the fact that, you know, it's armed to its teeth and the NRA's role in uh, in sort of uh, making sure that it stays that way, you know. But um, I think we see, you know, uh, this sort of racism also in Britain where there isn't that same sort of gun culture in a sense. You know, there is uh, systematic racism in this country as well. I know there, there are also ex-Muslims who say, oh, well, you know, let's, why are Black Lives Matters even protesting in Britain? Uh, and I think one of the things about the fact that it's become a worldwide movement to me says that this is personal for so many people. It, it is, hits yeah. a chord for so many people because they have lived it, you know. And and I love the fact that so many different types of people are out on the street. It has become, you know, I feel like I'm watching a civil rights movement part two, you know, a movement that it's just such a, an important movement for human history and human progress in the United States. It's, we're seeing a part two of it. And that's why I think it's really important that um, we as ex-Muslims, those of us who are fighting for the rights of uh, those who are uh, um, being persecuted and prosecuted for their thought that, you know, this is really another human rights um, battle that we need to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, but can I, if I can just add something else, you know, this, this discussion about the wider context. Look, we're talking about, for example, um, very recently, you know, this idea of race science and eugenics. It's not it's not ancient history. And how if you've read Angela Saini's book about Superior, called Superior, how that continues in various ways, this idea that people are biologically inferior, you know, and, uh, how, and, and how science is also used in, in order to sort of push forward that position or how it has been used to show that women, for example, are inferior. So again, this, this idea of statistics also needs to be looked at within the wider context of systematic racism. And, you know, Colonialism is another big uh, issue. I know a lot of uh, our, our ex-Muslims say these are history. You know, these are, uh, you're talking about things that are, are past. But look, we just had the Windrush scandal in the UK. And it's about people uh, who came here, um, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago as children who are were citizens of this country. Uh, and the Home Office, uh, it actually, was found out later that they tore up their landing cards and tried to deport uh, large numbers of these people. And many of them died while, um, you know, um, after they had been deported, they never were able to return to Britain. This was their country. Uh, so, you know, these, these um, historical things that, uh, you know, people say are part of history are very much still 
part of um, government policy, uh, for example, in the Windrush uh, affair and scandal. Also, I don't know if you heard about the whole issue around slavery, the Treasury uh, Department in the UK sent a tweet saying that everyone in Britain contributed to the end of slavery. And actually what came out of this tweet was the fact that Britain and us as taxpayers have been paying slave traders and their families uh, until 2015. It's an equivalent of, I don't know, 13 billion, um, Oh, what? 17 million pounds in today's money. And what's interesting is we're not paying uh, for reparations to slaves for being held as slaves, but we are paying slaveholders for loss of property. So this and is the that, reverse of, this is like the exact opposite of reparations. So don't tell me slavery is something that we are not interested in anymore. We are still paying for it. We're paying slave owners and their mm -hmm. families. I, I want to make just a quick point about people who say slavery, had, you know, ended so many years ago. Jim Crow, those laws ended many years ago. Um, I, I don't think people understand how the the mindsets behind it, the collective mindset behind it, uh, still continues to the day. And I, I, Yuval Noah Harari wrote about this actually in one of the most eloquent ways that I've seen in *Sapiens*, where he talked about, and I'll just summarize it really quick, uh, that throughout the time of slavery. Uh, black people were thought of as unclean, unintelligent, incompetent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they eventually they had the struggle. Uh, they Slavery ended. They were still thought of that same way. The stereotype was still the same. And eventually, uh, with the Jim Crow, uh, uh, you know, those laws from that time until, you know, desegregation happened, the same stereotypes persisted. Then once the desegregation ended and then they had, you know, they, they were equal to everybody else, they had the same opportunity as everybody else to go to university to avail whatever uh, tools that they had to advance themselves um many of them did and then they'd go up and they would say apply for a job and the people who were supposed to hire them thought that they were unclean unintelligent and incompetent and uh, they would prefer other people uh, mm -hmm. and often they they would so they were kept down in that sense and then later on the same people were saying well you know desegregation has ended for you know uh, it, it ended a long time ago uh, why aren't you able to get a job? Why aren't you able to advance yourself? Why can't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps? And mm -hmm. this is a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle of stereotypes right? that that is just uh, that continues to this day. It, it hasn't it hasn't ended. Um, and I, that is also one of the things that you know when when you look at Black Lives Matter and what they're trying to do. Uh, we think that it's all about George Floyd. Uh, it's it's not just about George George Floyd. It's it's about the, the overall system. George Floyd was just a catalyst. It was a straw that broke the camel's back, ultimately. George Floyd was a catalyst, but I think you know there are some instances in history where something really removes every mask, every mask, and no matter what uh, propaganda and lies were said. Uh, you know, in that moment, you see the face of, uh, in this instance, uh, police racism and brutality. You know, to sit on his neck for nearly nine minutes, to look uh, with, you know, with such impunity, with such uh, dehumanization in the sense that you're not really even, you know, uh, suffocating a human being. And the fact that you even knew that you're being filmed and it didn't, matter because the very officer Chauvin, however you say his name, Chauvin, Chauvin, mm -hmm. he had been, uh, you know, he had 18 other um, uh, reports against him, you know, and the fact that there is no accountability, there is no, uh, it, 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 which is why officers can act with impunity. And I think apart from that fact is that, you know, we're talking about something systematic. And I do want to add here that, you know, there's this idea that if you talk about systematic racism, uh, you are attacking white people. And I think the, 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 the thing about systematic racism is that it's in the system, even if you are an anti-racist in the system, the way uh, you know the laws work out, the way the policies work out, it constantly perpetrates 
that sort of racism. So one of the cases um, in the UK, which uh, which uh, highlighted institutionalized racism here in the in policing was the Stephen Lawrence case, and it was about a an 18 year old young man um, who was stabbed to death by a group of white racists in Eltham in Southeast London. And what happened is that uh, this was in 93, it took 20 years for those who, two, two of those who were responsible to actually be pr pr prosecuted for it. But what came out of this uh, racist killing and there's there's something there was a McPherson report that looked into the Stephen Lawrence killing. Um, what it it saw was that in all instances, uh, in in various ways, Stephen Lawrence, uh, the investigation, his family were failed uh, because they were not able to recognize both the racism that killed him, but also the racism that was preventing. Um, you know, uh, 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 preventing uh, police officers from actually arresting people and prosecuting them. So, you know, they, for example, they said there was no racism. They interviewed, um, I don't know how many police officers, um, I think it was 14 or so. Well, they interviewed a number of police officers and they just asked them, do you think that your judgments or actions were based on the fact that he was black, that nothing happened. And they said they didn't think that anything that they did was racist. And they genuinely believed that they acted without racism and without discrimination. And I think one of the things that we forget when we talk about racism is how it's in, in how it is, um, you know, very, it can be discreet, how sometimes it's not overt. Uh, but that it has an effect in various layers, um, mm -hmm. you know, of, of of every aspect of people's lives, which is why people are so fed up as well. Yeah. So uh, one of the statistics that does come up you're on the other side, the people who dispute it, actually, this is one of their, the only real point that they actually bring up a lot of times is that, yes, you know, the studies that show, and this is specifically when it comes to police shootings and lethal force, is that uh, the blacks are uh, 2.5 times, in some cases by some studies, four times more likely uh, to be killed than whites, right? And mm -hmm. blacks are 13% uh, of the population in the United States, um, but are responsible for about half of the, the crime, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the reason that uh, they are being uh, killed more is because they're engaging in more interactions. There's more policing of black neighborhoods because they need more policing. There's more crime in, in black communities because they tend to be the lower, lower socioeconomic class. Um, and, 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 so, and, and they're saying that that is why all of this happens. But they say this as if all of the other studies that have been done have not recognized that. Mm -hmm. like, you know, basic researchers don't know about this fact and don't correct for that when they, when they actually do their studies, and which they do. And they often dismiss things like when, again, when we're talking about the zooming out, when you go out from the police shootings and the killings and you actually look at the entire system, there's a study just done, I think, a couple of months ago or maybe just last month. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll provide uh, a, a link to a repository of the Washington Post where they have these countless studies. So, you know, you'll see a few studies here and there that talk about how there's no racial bias. And this is just a treasure trove of studies that shows the exact opposite. Uh, or just overwhelming proof that uh, systemic racism exists. But yeah, the study that happened uh, last month was uh, they were looking at cops who pull over uh, people. And I have, I've had a personal experience with this with one of my black friends that I spoke about previously, and I'll, I'll repeat here in a second. Um, and they noticed, and, and this was a study of count, like many, many, many um, uh, sort of roadside stops when cops pull over uh, drivers. Uh, they found that there was a clear racial disparity like black people were several times more likely to be stopped um, compared to whites. But they also looked at the data after the sun went down in the evening, mm -hmm. in the right. dark, when and you couldn't see the race of the driver. And right. the disparity disappeared. Yeah. Right? So they actually confirmed, yeah. they corrected for that. Well, is it just because they're in black neighborhoods? Is it this, is it that? No, they, cor they corrected for it by confirming that the racial disparity does disappear when you can't see what the race of the driver is. 
-hmm. Now, if you have that already, th that is evidence, that's clear evidence of systemic racism. Um, how would we assume that that is, that is completely separate from how they treat black people when it comes to other things? How mm -hmm. can you separate that from everything else? But you can't, and, and that's yeah, what we mean, yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. And also, I mean, I want to question, I want to question this this uh, this criminal cr criminalization of the black male, you know, and this idea that constantly when we're discussing this is about how they're always committing crimes and they're responsible for so many crimes, which then seems to justify murdering them and brutalizing them. And again, from, you know, as I said, statistics, Everyone uses statistics to promote their politics. I'm putting my politics on the table. If you want to defend white nationalism and white identity politics, that's fine. Let's not hide behind the statistics. But if we look at, uh, there's this, uh, for me, I think a lot of the, the facts come not from official accounts, but from activist accounts. In the same way that facts about ex-Muslims comes from us. It doesn't come do. from official accounts, you know. If we listen to official accounts, there are no gay people in Iran and, you know, uh, everyone hung in Iran uh, is a drug dealer, even though we know they've been killed for political reasons. If we're, well, I know, Iran is supposedly big on trans rights because they force exactly. gay people to get to, to have sex changes. I mean, it's just... Exactly. So, so what I'm trying to say is I, I know people will say you can't compa compare Iran with the United States. But, you know, for me, I'm skeptical of those in power, especially when it's based, you know, for, first of all, we've got Trump as president, so the mask has fallen. You've got the George, George Floyd uh, murder that really showed people. I think that's what made the shift is people saw it with their own eyes. And I think yeah. you have those moments where really it shifts culture, it shifts public opinion. And if, if you look at this, there's a website called mapping police evidence sorry mm -hmm. mapping police violence.org and right. they talk about how uh there were only 27 days in 2019 where police didn't kill someone mm -hmm. and it said that of course black people are three times more likely to be killed than white people they're 1.3 times more likely to be unarmed compared to white people and it also depends on the state that they're in so if you live in Oklahoma, uh, you're six times more likely to be killed than if you live in Georgia. And the other statistic that's really interesting, if you look at their graph, is that uh, it's not about crime because the level of violent crime in US cities don't determine the rate of police violence. Um, and so they, they've given an example of Buffalo, New York, where um, the percent of people of color is 50%, violent crime rate is 12 per thousand. Zero people have been killed in Buffalo by Buffalo police from 2013 to 16. And then you've got Florida where the percent, per, percent of the people of color is 42%, violent crime rate is nine per thousand, so less than Buffalo, but 13 people have been killed by Orlando police in that same period. And also the fact that there's no accountability, 99% of the police killings from 2013 to 19 haven't resulted in anyone being charged. So you never really get to know what the story is because they, they don't go to a court. There's no evidence given right. in those cases. And it's what they say. And and this when you're talking about evidence, I mean, from the from uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, another uh, research, peer-reviewed research article, um, uh, by Frank Edwards and Hedwig Lee and Michael mm -hmm. Esposito. So here's a, you know, just, so brace yourself for this. Um, police violence is one of the leading causes of young men, of the, of the death for young men in the United States. And the lifetime risk of a black man to be killed by police is one in 1,000. So again, over the course of their lifetime, mm -hmm about one in every 1,000 black men, one in 1,000 black men can expect to be killed by police. I mean, that's, that's staggering. Now, you look at the disproportionate crime rates, and yes, they tend to be, you know, the, there's more violent crime in black communities. And, you know, when we come up with those counter arguments, we also have to look at what is being implied. Like, what's being implied? So there's more crime in black communities. What does that mean? Does that mean they can't be fixed? Is it in their DNA? Is it genetic? Is it just like that? Um, are we just going to talk about that? Well, 
period. There's more black, more crime in black communities. So, you know, they are overrepresented in these shootings. And that's it. We're just going to leave it there. Like, what is that a sign of? Why is there lower socioeconomic? Um, why are why are blacks consistently at a lower socioeconomic status? Right? Why aren't they able to come up? What are the reasons for that? And are those reasons systemic? And that will also bring you back to this whole conversation about systemic racism. And uh, so, one more thing I want to point out is that when you talk about systemic racism, not not you, Maria, but you know, just when we talk about systemic racism, we think of it as just there's a whole bunch of cops so you know a whole bunch of law enforcement officials who are out there to just find black people and kill them and that's not what it is that's not what systemic racism is it's 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 kind of the opposite it's a lot of people who may not be racist at all who are part of the system will engage in tactics uh that will be perpetrated because of a systemic racism sometimes unknowingly they they're not going to know about it i think uh, there was a psychologist we talked about uh, how uh, sort of when they were talking about how implicit uh, bias works is that, you know when we use um, when we talk about Google searches you know the, the brand has just become a verb now you know Google search we don't even realize that we're talking about a brand anymore and th that's kind of how systemic racism works so you know when people say well systemic racism we don't have any evidence of that but we know that Derek Chauvin was a racist cop um, it might actually be the opposite. Would Derek Chauvin have done that to a white guy if it wasn't George Floyd? I mean, that has happened with Tony Tempa in the past. I don't know in his mind. We can't look in his mind and see if he was racist or not. But we can look at the overall system that he is operating in, right? And that system is what eventually uh, is responsive. That's where their training happens. That's uh, mm -hmm. how they're taught. That is a kind of, you know, when they work with their peers, you know, the, the blue shield and that mentality, how that develops. Uh, all of that comes from the system, and we can we can talk about that. That even even black cops, even um, brown cops, are sometimes more likely to internalize these these uh, racist the, the racist system. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think that there's any evidence that this cop who killed uh, George Floyd. There's no definitive evidence that that he himself was racist. Now he might have just been a terrible. Well, he was obviously a horrible person, but what we know is what we do know and there is overwhelming evidence for is that there is a system there's a system and if you look at you know we talked about the pullovers of uh, of, of them you look at they're more likely not to be not only to be arrested but even when you correct for the kind of crime that they commit um the extent of violence that they commit and and the the socioeconomic factors they receive longer sentences they're more likely to receive longer sentences they're more likely uh, to be convicted, right? There's also, and I'm going to just uh, find this really, really quickly, uh, Mariam, if you can give me a second, um, is uh, their bail, the bail for the exact same crime. Yeah. Right? The amount of bail that Black, and I want to actually give the actual numbers here really quickly. If you can just give me a second, let me find out. Right, so in 2011, uh, there was a study of bail in five large U.S. counties. So black people received $7,000 higher bail than whites for violent crimes, $13,000 higher for drug crimes, and $10,000 higher crimes, $10,000 higher crimes for uh, for crimes that were related to, uh, higher bail for crimes related to public order. Okay, And these disparities in bail, I mean, the, they, were, they were calculated after they had adjusted for how serious the crime was, you know, what the criminal history, they looked at the criminal history of the whites and the blacks, they adjusted and they corrected for all of that. And after that, they found these, these massive differences in just, just bail for them. Um, and these are the same people who are, who are doing this, the same justice system uh, that is uh, sort of de deciding what the bail is going to be for this. And are, are the same, it's the same justice system that is training the, uh, the cops, yeah. you know, training the police. I, I mean, yeah, just, just to, um, Add to what you were saying, I mean, there's the sentencing project and they've uh, collected some stats about this. And uh, what they've said is, I mean, to, to add to what you've said is that African-Americans are more likely than white Americans to be arrested. Once they're arrested, they're more likely to be convicted. Once they're convicted, they're more likely to in, 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 um, experience lengthier prison sentences. Right. 
Um, African-American adults are 5.9 times as likely to be incarcerated than whites and Hispanics, um, are, are 3.1 times as likely. And as of 2001, one of every three black boys born in that year could expect to go to prison in his lifetime, mm -hmm. as one of every six Latinos compared to one of every 17 white boys. So there is, of course, this whole prison industrial complex in the United States, but um, the, the, the sort of bias in the criminal justice system is really uh, very evident. And as you said, if there's a lot of evidence how two people having done the same crime with the same background, uh, one is white, one is black, there's going to be differences in the length of sentence and treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a much wider issue. Um, but I do want to go back to this issue of, um, you know, um, the, the sort of the stress on violence and the criminalization of black men uh, in America and elsewhere. And you see that criminalization uh, with regards to migrants, for example, as well. You know, all those male asylum seekers, they're here to rape European women, uh, white women. Uh, there is this sort of um, this propaganda that kind of feeds into uh, a, a fear in a sense, it creates this fear of uh, black men or of uh, migrants, for example, young migrant men, in a way that therefore allows for people to remain silent uh, with, despite the brutality that they face. Yeah. And also when you look at, um, you know, the levels of violence, for example, uh, it's always, uh, violence usually is always um, measured when it comes to people who are poor, who are black, who are minorities, who are working class. But the violence that's much more expansive and that affects so many other people across many borders is often seen to be legal, legitimate. And so there is this sort of, uh, you know, buying into um, a, a a, a type of propaganda against people who are poor and who are disenfranchised and, um, you know, don't have uh, very many opportunities. I mean, also, when you look at budgets, I mean, I think you might have, you must have seen, and many of our viewers might have seen, uh, the NYPD's budget. I mean, it is in the billions of pounds, dollars, yeah, billions yeah. of dollars. And yet they are cutting, they are cutting schools, they are cutting libraries, they are cutting, um, you know, um, services, resources for the community. So the whole defund the police campaign, um, you know, and I, you know, I think this is something that I don't know, Gita Sahgyal or Pragna Patel or Rahila Gupta, one of them mentioned, I can't remember who, but about we know very clearly how dangerous community policing can be because, you know, then you have the mullahs telling us what to do in mm -hmm. our Muslim communities. Uh, but also, you know, the fact that defund the police talks about the fact that so much funds is going into state violence because I do think really, if I'm completely honest, that I feel that, you know, the, the KKK and the white supremacy and that attitude has legalized itself in a police force. Not to say that everybody in the police force is a member of the KKK, but when we're talking about that institutionalized uh, racism, uh, you know, someone had written an article about black people being killed at a rate of two per week. That's how many lynchings took place, you know, during the Jim Crow era. Mm -hmm. And I kind of do see the, the parallels there. Um, and the fact that, you know, so much of that violence is seen to be normal and business as usual, whereas uh, people, um, uh, you know, pushed to the corner, that violence is what's often looked at uh, and not, not the larger context of what's going on. Yeah, um, yeah. I see. I think that the one of the problems with def like I think that defund the police. The idea, the example they gave with Camden, New Jersey, um, and as you said, there's the, these police departments have monstrous budgets. Yeah. Yeah, but the problem is they're dealing with things that they really shouldn't have to deal with. Exactly. Traffic stops where you see all of these sort of videos. I mean, wh why do you need um, super armed police with tasers and guns and everything to, to giving out? you know, speeding tickets. You shouldn't need that. 
to dealing with homelessness, dealing with drug addiction. Um, you should have substance abuse specialists dealing with that. You should have social workers dealing with domestic, uh, uh, you know, domestic uh, issues and those complaints and, and responding to that. Of course, police would have a role, would be a secondary role, but it's also putting too much pressure on the police. That if there is a mental health issue, if there is a homelessness issue, if there is a sort of a, just a small speeding ticket, you know, you go, you, you get a ticket going too fast, um, you know, you pay it or you contest it. It's such a simple, uh, it's not the kind of thing that you need um, armed police for. They can have a role there. Of course, you need a role. These things can go wrong really quick. Uh, but that's what they mean by defund the police. Admittedly, and I have to say this, it's, it's, it's not very good branding. Uh, when they say defund the police, because you have to explain it every time. Um, so I, I hope they would call it something like uh, something something else that would also fit on a protest side that would be actually a lot clear, clearer, even even something more aggressive like radical police reform. Um, yeah. But I, I think it's it, you know these are times that you have to push for fundamental changes, you know, mm -hmm. and because you know you've got the attention. And these are steps to move the, the thing forward. Now, you know, I sort of kind of feel that um, this shift, though, is going to be difficult because I think the police do play an important role in managing communities, you know, for the those in power. And it is really and that's why there is so much violence attached to it, because um, I, I do really believe that, that that is the purpose of the police. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the purpose of the police to uh, violently suppress um, uh, minority communities, manage them, keep them in their place in the same way that Sharia courts are designed to put women and dissenters in their place. I think it has a very important role that we kind of sometimes don't see when we talk about uh, reforming the police as if I, I wonder if it really is reformable given mm -hmm. given the role the important role that it plays for those in power and so I sometimes feel that the sort of defund the police is an important way of bringing a sort of radical perspective in into this where none exists because you know reform is not enough you know, yeah. given how systematic it is. You know? It's like the conversation we have about reforming Islam versus uh, being ex-Muslim a lot of times. But I, I think that, um, I mean, if you look at it, uh, what Minneapolis is doing is they're dismantling the entire police force and then they're building again from the ground up. Um, there's a misunderstanding that uh, this means that they're going to absolutely get rid of policing, which is not the case. In yeah. Camden, New Jersey, they didn't get rid of the police. They just, they dismantled what they had um, they rehired a lot of the officers. They they implemented new systems of training, and I think you know if we're drawing, you know, if we're talking about ex-Muslims and Islam and Muslims, and and we're drawing uh, parallels there. I do feel that I understand why a lot of police officers, and and this is you know I I've had friends who are police officers as well, and you know they're amazing people who have who are conscientious and they've done things. Um, They've, they, they've always had the best of intentions and they became police officers because they wanted to do good. Uh, so sometimes what happens is, and there are obviously there are a lot of police officers who are black, there are a lot of police officers who are brown as well. Um, so I think, again, this comes down to that question of the system, right? So, so you can have these individual police officers, some of them may be good, some of them may be bad. Uh, there'll be a whole bunch of them. It's, it's like Muslims, you know, a lot of Muslims, some of them adhere to it, some of them don't. Uh, but the, and when people say, "Well, it's not Islam that's the problem. Islam is great. The problem is these individual Muslims are causing problems." Uh, and and what I usually say in response, and I know that a lot of times you do too, is that no, it's not that. It's the other way around. Most Muslims are actually good people. You know, they're regular people who want the same thing that everybody else does. But it's a system. It's the ideology um, that is problematic. And I, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, for me, you know, if I'm going to be very honest, I hate the police. I, I, uh, I, when I, and I hate immigration officers. I shake when I pass a border. Uh, when I see the police, it does give me the feeling of when I pass a mosque. It makes me feel very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, I, and again, it's not, you know, I, as you say, there are lots of, there might be wonderful police officers, I'm sure. Yeah. But as a system, I think it's really, 
unjust. It's really unfair. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's why when we talk about systematic racism, uh, it's important to not, it, it's not an attack on individual officers, though many of them are racist. Of course. Definitely they are. And one of the problems is that they can be racist with impunity. There is no accountability. And therefore, you know, it's, uh, they can do as they please. And I think, you know, we're seeing because of the shift in culture and the fact that people have recognized the systematic racism, you know, a, a young man gets uh, shot at uh, a Wendy's in, in Atlanta and uh, people start having to resign, you know, and I think it shows like, okay, so when the pressure is on, there is the possibility to have accountability. And I think yeah. that's why, but you know, I am very much on the left and I do think that racism like sexism is very much intertwined with capitalism and a, a system that puts human uh, welfare uh, right at the end and puts profit right at the beginning. And so I do feel that a lot of the gains we make, uh, you know, if we're not constantly vigilant, it can be taken away right away because the system is set up that way. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we can see that like in abortion with regards to abortion rights in the United States, you know, it's just a constant fight. It's a constant battle. And the minute you take your eye off, they're there cutting and trying to, um, you know, deny you your rights in various ways. So it's tiring. It's tiring. You know, you can't be in the streets every day. Uh, and so, while we are in the streets, like in Black Lives Matters, uh, you know, I think it's important to push uh, as much as we can in their defense because it will benefit all of us. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I really do believe in that saying where an injury to one is an injury to all. This is not a slogan. It is a, a reality in the sense that if you live in societies that are unequal, it affects everybody, even those who are not facing that inequality directly, you know. So in Iran, men also suffer uh, at uh, in a situation where women are so humiliated and, um, uh, you know, criminalized in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, being forced to wear the hijab, being segregated. It affects your loved ones as well. It affects your friends, you know, and it affects the society because I, I also do think that, uh, you know, they always come for the weakest first. They always come for the weakest first, but they will come after you eventually. I do really believe that. And I think uh, if you don't fight for the weakest, um, you know, it, it, makes, it, it makes it more difficult to fight once they've paved the way and normalized, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, their violence against uh, whatever group it is. So um, I, that's why, I, I mean, I, I think ex-Muslims, um, one of the things uh, I know we've been very critical of is identity politics. And I don't know if I can mention that here now, Ali, or... Yeah, uh, well, uh, the, you've been... Well, you, of course, you can talk about mention anything you want to, but... Um, and identity politics is actually something I wanted to talk to you about because I okay. know you have always, always, every time I've heard you speak, you've always talked about um, identity politics and how problematic it is. Um, yeah. And often, you know, what we hear, uh, again, from people who are right-leaning is we, they complain about identity politics all the time. They're talking about the fetishization, the, you know, they talk about the fetishization of, you know, black culture and, and brown culture, but uh, they're often blind to the much more insidious uh, identity politics on the right, which is about, you know, we're white nationalism, we're, you know, European Judeo-Christian heritage and all of these, you know, other things that national, what is Europe, you know, what are the nation states of Europe, we have to maintain our identity, we, we have to define it in a certain way, and, and as, as if somehow it's immutable, and it's never going to change. And so that, that perspective is often missed. Um, but you, I think, are one of the only people I know who has called out both, both of them. And I, I in the in the Amsterdam conference, you also had Keenan Malik, who came mm -hmm. in an excellent speech about this, but but go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, one of the things I want to say is that I think amongst ex-Muslims, there's a confusion on what identity politics is. And in a sense, they feel that they don't want to support Black Lives Matter because they think that it is, uh, an, uh, 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 it is supporting identity politics. And what I've tried to explain before with regards ex-Muslims is that we are uh, a community 
in the sense that we are a community in protest, but not in the sense of identity politics. So uh, we are fighting together as ex-Muslims for human rights, for an end to discrimination, for an end to apostasy and blasphemy laws that can kill us. But we are not a homogeneous group where we think the same and we have our um, sheikhs or whoever, you know, managing our community and representing us. We're individuals with our political points of view. And I think um, it's important to make a distinction between liberation movements, between movements that are defending universal rights, that are defending, um, uh, you know, uh, basic human rights, uh, like the Black Lives Matter uh, versus um, identity politics, which um, defends a form of narrow nationalism, whether it's black nationalism, white nationalism, uh, this idea that it's um, it's only your group that matters and only the authentic members of your group matter. And we've seen that in the so-called Muslim community. Uh, we do see aspects of that also in Black Lives Matter uh, matters. Uh, activists that we see on the street, again, Black Lives Matter itself as an organization doesn't, as far as I can tell, subscribe to that because you have to look at their website, their mission statements, the fact that so many different people are welcomed in their protest. It shows that they see this as a very universal movement for equality and end to police brutality and also um, like I just want to give you an example of um, uh, problems with identity politics. You've got, uh, for example, Black and uh, Caribbean uh, women's group, Sister Space, which is against uh, violence um, and for women's rights um, in, in London, who are critical of South Hall Black Sisters and why South Hall Black Sisters call themselves Black when they're Asian women. And of course, South Hall Black Sisters call them black, themselves Black because they come from a generation, as I do, where we subscribe to black liberation politics and our politics were seen to be black as opposed to identity politics. So what I wanna say is I, what identity politics does with that example is that it, it allows us to fight each other when we need to be looking at those in power that are promoting um, the inequality and the racism and the discrimination. And identity politics very often uh, makes you only focus on your own group and it is a double-edged sword because this idea that you're different can often mean that you're superior and we see that even amongst ex-Muslims you know superior to Muslims for example so I do think that we need to support Black Lives Matters uh, unconditionally in the sense of supporting the aims but also very clearly being against all forms of identity politics uh, and pushing forward an agenda that really is for uh, rights for all and against state violence and police brutality is a huge part of that violence. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question to you, I guess somewhat related to identity politics is, uh, and this is uh, the question of uh, white privilege, right? So when we talk about white privilege, I've seen different views on this. I mean, right now there's an unprecedented number of white people um, in fact, the majority of white people, uh, in fact, the majority of Republicans, as we said, uh, who are acknowledging that systemic racism exists uh, in policing, that are acknowledging uh, that, uh, you know, that are showing some level of support mm -hmm. for these protesters and, and Black Lives Matter. Now, uh, at this point, you know, when we talk about white privilege, uh, which is obviously it's a real thing, we all know that, uh, but is it... Uh, a distraction? Does it uh, take mm -hmm. focus away from the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter movement and their focus on really trying to get rid of um, systemic racism? Or uh, is it something that needs to be discussed as part of it? I, I mean, I personally don't like the term white privilege because I do think, and, and Keenan Malik just did a mm -hmm. really good article about it, where he said, viewing white people, I'm just going to quote, as guilty and complicit distorts political issues and deflects from real causes. It's, it's very, and, that's exactly I, what I think too. Yeah, yeah I, I think it is problematic yeah. too because look, the reality is that we know ourselves uh, from our experience as activists that, uh, you know, if you're fighting for women's rights, there could be women who are anti-women's rights, who are pro, pro uh, even stoning of women in Iran, 
you know, uh, who are part of the Islamic Assembly, who who defend stoning of women, and they are women. Uh, you know, uh, you've got Margaret Thatcher was a woman, and her policies were anti uh, many aspects of people's lives, including against single mothers, for example. You know, so what I want to say is the fact that you are uh, white doesn't make you a racist. The fact that you are black doesn't necessarily make you an anti-racist because we've seen uh, some black conservatives, for example, defending, um, you know, um, Trump and defending uh, police uh, police violence, really, and saying that most probably they deserved it. Uh, I mean, I've seen videos of black conservatives say things like that. So what I want to say is... Uh, who we are doesn't represent our politics and so i think that that is very important and i think white privilege does uh muddy the waters by by one making it seem as if uh white people are not necessarily anti-racist and they can be and also there's very it's very much a class issue you know there are lots for uh, poor people. And I think even if you look at the US policing where, you know, 50% of the people killed are white, I'm pretty sure that the vast majority are poor and working class, because that's what actually what it is, is this violence against the poor and the working class, white or black. And I think it's important. And I think people are seeing those links, which is why there's so many white people out in Black Lives Matters protests as well. Um, but I guess the point I want to make is that the concept of privilege, though, is a real concept in the sense that we understand as ex-Muslims when we talk about the privilege of the religious, you know, this, the fact that religion is the default of society. And uh, you know that as someone who's gay, you know, the default is that the society is straight, you know. Uh, you know that if you're a woman, the default is that society is male and therefore the reality is that society as a default not talking about individuals but as a system is white the default is white and therefore i i can understand you know um what people mean when they talk about it i do agree though that it's a distraction yeah that's uh, i i think that too i and i think that keenan malik in the same article um he, he did a very good job of articulating that as well um, uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about was that, you know, so th this is part of every movement. I know that a lot of people are freaking out about the looting and about the destroying of statues and the vandalism and the violence. Um, and yes, there, there was a black cop who was also killed. And, you know, these, these things happen every, every movement, every transformative movement in history, things like this have happened It happened in the feminist movement. There are some people who made the, you know, the the really sort of extreme elements of it, they made it the face of the movement, but ultimately in the end, um, it was the really, the core idea of the movement that won out. So uh, right now there is, uh, you know, people are concerned about historical revisionism and you know, how people want to rewrite history. They want to get rid of books like Huckleberry Finn, you know, uh, Mark Twain's writings, uh, which I, I never thought of as anti-racist at all. Um, I think it was more where he was trying to expose it, but you know they they do have the N word in them and so on, and they want to get rid of them from libraries. Uh, they want to get rid of um, this the statues of Winston Churchill. Uh, there's a street in, in the city that I live called Winston Churchill, and they want to change the name of it. There's you know small sort of small fringe campaigns that want to do that. Um, I saw speaking of identity politics, I saw an article where uh, they wanted to get rid of the Gandhi. There's a petition saying that, you know, we want to get rid of the Gandhi statue because he's racist. And I'm thinking, okay, so someone acknowledged that racism can exist within minorities as well. Um, and so I, I'm not disputing that. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, it's, it's, it's not really revisionism if, uh, or erasure of um, um, Winston Churchill, for example, if, his statue is not there anymore. I mean, I think, you know, there, there's a thing to, there's a, a, an argument to be made that maybe you can have these things in museums. Um, uh, but in a sense, when you think that statues are really glorifying or memorializing things, um, mm -hmm. and that it is, you know, times have moved on. And I think this goes back to what Angela Davis said about how society, you know, the post-slavery, the post-colonial, the post-imperialist society 
uh, and I think that's still continuing, but hasn't been adjusted to include those who have been kept out for so long. And that's why you have so many memorials glorifying slave owners and, you know, uh, Churchill, for example, my, my son is studying him, he's 14 now, he's studying Churchill. Oh, he sounds like a wonderful man, you know, but if you look at, um, you know, what happened in India, the, the famine, uh, there's the so many people killed, the Mau Mau in Kenya. Uh, I think it's important to, you know, teach, especially in education, teach our children um, the realities of, of uh, these um, these leaders and the effects of their policies. I mean, Stalin also fought fascism, but I really don't want a statue of Stalin anywhere. You know? of Stalin. And I'm quite happy when it gets pulled down. To be honest, I'm not really crying. I know it's not going to be very popular. I'm not crying that, you know, Winston Churchill's, there was a term racist on it. Well, you know, that is a perspective. And I think it's important to open that dialogue and to uh, and that 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 conversation isn't open because victors write history, victors decide who is glorified and who is memorialized. You know, no one representing um, us is ever memorialized. So yeah. you know, it's it's not. You know, people say, well, statues of people you support will be torn down. There isn't any statue of anyone that I support generally. Do you know what yeah. I mean? No, I, I understand. I think that. Um... The, the thing with the statues is that there's uh, there was a video clip of uh, of President Obama who was talking about uh, how complicated people are. You know, so mm -hmm. there are two ways that I look at this. First of all, when it comes to the statues, them coming down or not, I've I've never cared for statues in general. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, and I agree. You know, you can have them in museums if they're sculptures, like works of art. It doesn't matter what it is. It's something to be appreciated. Uh, for the art, not necessarily for the person, but uh, you know, he had so what what Obama said was that you know people in history, and this is something we all know, uh, are complex. Uh, there is a very good likelihood. When I was younger, like when I was growing up in the eighties, uh, I I evolved my views on a lot of things. I grew up in a school where homophobia, right, and using homophobic slurs was the norm. It was, you know, we used to, people used to, we used to, I used to use that. Everybody used to insult each other with those things all the time, uh, saying that something is too gay or, you know. So those kinds of things were actually quite common until there was a realization overall that this is not the right thing to do. And then many of us thought, many of us changed the way that we thought. And the same thing goes with racism and, and misogyny and so on. So when we go back, if we existed at that time, many of us who are good people, who think of ourselves as conscientious, good moral people, probably would have had the same kinds of attitudes uh, that people around that time did until we were awakened to, you know, what, what the, until there was a debate or there was a conversation about it. So when we look at people in the past who did great things, um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, there are ambiguities and there are, you know, complicated layers to uh, their personalities. So, sure, Ali. But the problem is that this conversation is uh, is uh, is not is not possible. Uh, this conversation is uh, is closed. It's a monologue yeah. because the point is that those in power have very good reason for why they've put a slave owner and Winston Churchill or what have you um, or King Leopold up and why they mm -hmm. haven't done others, you know? And I think yeah, that uh, even for many of the statues, uh, like even this, the statue, the Colson statue that was uh, thrown in the water in Bristol, there have been years of discussion, but, you know, it hasn't been taken seriously. And I think, you know, I'm sort of a direct action activist. I do think that sometimes, you know, we, uh, people who want to change things need to push uh, the boundaries uh, for conversations to happen. And uh, of course, I don't uh, subscribe to violence, but I do think that, you know, throwing a statue in a river is not violence. Um, I'm not sure, you know, and I think it, it opens up a conversation. I, 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 anyway, I'm not crying over it, basically, yeah. that's that way, you know. Um, but I do think that sometimes these things have to happen in order for these conversations to be had, because 
in, in your school as well on gay rights. I mean, there were huge riots for gay rights. You Absolutely. Know? There were uh, brutalized uh, for for raising the issue. They were attacked by the police. Um, um, assassinated. They were killed. Like uh, Harvey Milk was assassinated. So, mm -hmm. so these are, you know, I think when we're looking after the fact, we only see uh, because it's changed and shifted culture, we only see it as a positive thing, but we don't see the fights that took place. And I think sometimes it's difficult to see how important things are while it's happening around us. And that's why I think, you know, this is a key moment and one that we should be paying real attention to. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I couldn't agree more. So, and I'm so glad to have your voice uh, here. That and, and we're gonna. I want to start taking some of the questions. There's a few questions here from from some of the people watching, so mm -hmm. we'll go to that. Um, I wanted to ask you one last point before we went to that, and and that is, you know, we we're talking about stats. We talked about some of the problems with, you know, stats like they come from police officers and so on. Um, often in the with data, uh, people do start dismissing certain things as anecdotes. And I find that especially strange coming from ex-Muslims because, you know, how many times have you been told, well, you know, your experience isn't real. You're only, you only left Islam so you could, you know, have sex and drink alcohol. And that's all you wanted to do. Um, in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, when, when that, you know, 2015, when that, they had that spate of, of killings with, you know, with Avijit Roy, who was a friend, um, and, and others following that, mm -hmm. the whole bunch of secular bloggers, uh, people were talking about how this is not a, is not a serious issue in Bangladesh. The government is officially secular. You know, they've issued a statement against it, and um, as if it's it's not a systemic problem, discrimination against apostates, or you know, this sort of mob, the government turning a blind eye to mobs going around and doing whatever they want to um, religious dissidents uh, is is not. And all we had was anecdotes. With with ex Muslims, I see that you know the videos that ex Muslims of North America does. Uh, they are stories, they're personal stories that you hear. Um, and the question is, do you, do you dismiss them because there's no data? Uh, when Rodney King was beaten, and I, I was in high school in 1991, um, this is you know at the time not everybody had a cell phone camera at this time. Nobody could really film anything, but somebody had this old school camera and there was this grainy VHS video footage of this man being just, brut just brutally beaten to a pulp by four uh, white police officers. And, you know, the, the Los Angeles riots happened then. I mean, this was in the, in the early 90s. If people asked at that time, well, you know, we don't know if this is really happening. Where's the evidence? There wouldn't really be a lot of evidence at that time, would it? I mean, this is one of the first sort of video documented cases of something like this happening. Now, people who had been listening, I used to listen to a lot of NWA, you know, the Fuck the Police, they had that song. And Ice-T had a song called Cop Killer, which was very controversial, even though now he plays a cop on TV now, but it was a cry of protest, right? It was an it was artistic expression of how so many people felt. You know, how when you said that, I just, I hate the police. You know, there was that kind of song. So those of us who'd been kind of listening to that, we didn't see it as much of a surprise, but a lot of people found it really, really shocking that this existed, but there was no data, there was no evidence, because this is an ongoing inquiry. This is an ongoing process where we're still finding out about it. And any conclusions that you draw on this um, are going to be at, at, about you know disparities, about the lack of disparities actually, is going to be based on partial evidence. Uh, but on the other hand, when it comes to um, evidence for systemic racism, whether you look at historically with slavery, with Jim Crow, with all of the employment uh, disparities uh, between blacks and whites, healthcare, uh, the criminal justice reform, just society in general, the evidence is overwhelming. And that's, that's um, kind of where I, I land on this. Uh, and yeah, I think, and I think it's really great that you came and talked about this, especially for the perspective of uh, ex-Muslims where they can actually see this, as you said, we're not just allies, this is what our struggle is. Uh, we have always talked about how, uh, you know, a lot of times people who are left leftists tend to turn a blind eye to um, uh, Islamic, or, I mean, they're uh, Islamic apolog they're apologists for a lot of the Islamic supremacy, that they'll turn a blind eye to Islamic supremacy. We've complained about that for years, 
right? But now a lot of the same people complaining about it are turning a blind eye to white supremacy and denying that it exists. And they've become sort of the Raza Aslans on the, on the opposite side, right? So in any case. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I can just add to that. I mean, I think that um, I, I do find that, uh, especially uh, from the um, whole situation around Brexit, that I have been accused uh, by some ex-Muslims of being anti-white um, um, and also being anti-English and British. And I think, uh, for example, well, I'm also British and English because just because mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant doesn't exclude me from it. But it is, it reminds me very much like the accusations of Islamophobia and equating criticism of Islam with bigotry. Uh, here, it, and, and again, that is using white identity, uh, sorry, um, identity policies in the sense that Muslims are seen as one community, one identity, and criticism, uh, any criticism is seen as an attack on the Muslim community. And likewise, with regards Brexit, for example, uh, it's seen as an attack on white people and an attack on, on British people or English people. And also, we've got this um, as you say, this whataboutery, you know, um, very often when we talk about ex-Muslim rights, uh, we hear about people saying, well, what about um, U.S. imperialism? And what about um, uh, the discrimination against Muslims? And you're hearing whataboutery from ex-Muslims as well. You know, you talk about the slave trade in the U.S. and it's Britain's role. And they'll say, well, what about the Islamic tra slave trade? Uh, as if one cancels yeah. out other and uh, why can't we be against both you know which is an argument we've very often had in, in the ex-muslim movement and also this idea that criticism is akin to bullying and i i am seeing that more now amongst ex-muslims where we disagree on black lives matters and uh, people are being accused of bullying someone because they disagree with their views and i find it interesting how all of the things that we've stood up against has into discussions when there is polarization and tension. And I would, I think that we all really need to look at how we're sort of uh, replicating the very things that we've been critical of for, for, for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's go on to some questions. Uh, the first question here is, and you'll see it on your screen, Miriam, too, uh, is from uh, Gita Segel. Um, she's saying, should we issue a statement about Black Lives Matter, those of us who work on religion as well as race? Should there be a formal statement? Well, uh, Gita Sakal is, uh, you know, really a long-term veteran, women's rights campaigner, anti-racism campaigner. She's been one of the, um, you know, just a, a huge supporter of, um, ex-Muslims, as well as, uh, you know, uh, campaigning against Sharia courts you know, for minority women's rights, uh, and uh, on so many fronts she's fought. And I don't know if you know Gita Sakya's background, but she was um, suspended from Amnesty International because she criticized their relationship with caged prisoners, which is sort of like a jihadi front here in the UK. And so she's someone who's really fought on many different fronts. And I think it is important um, that we issue a statement uh, to uh, also to, for Black Lives Matter to know that it's a movement that we support, but also to start making them think about us and how our movements are fighting for equality, fighting for uh, dignity, fighting for uh, for liberation, an end to discrimination, end to state violence. I mean, that's a huge aspect of the work of ex-Muslims, an end to state violence, an end to state brutality. Very often, uh, you know, uh, meets that by the, the police, by um, um, uh, armed forces as well. Do you know what I mean? That sort mm -hmm. of militarized uh, aspects of, of the state. Right. Um, so and and vigilantes as well, which is something that Black Lives Matters also deals with. So I think it would be important to do that, and maybe we can ask Gita to draft it for us because she's like an expert in yeah. this. Yeah, and she's taking the initiative. I have a question. I think uh, this one's for me. Uh, Mars is asking um, it, uh, Ali how, how to apply correction to the uh, system without capitulating to the woke. 
we need to make reforms that uh, but sentiment could fuel the woke in making changes that are damaging in the long run so here's the thing about the the woke what um, is woke because i'm too old to understand this and these terms <laughs> really annoy the hell out of me yeah the the woke is uh, sort of so here's the thing you know how you have social this is internet speak for a, a a group of people who are sort of very leftist but they are very dogmatic leftists as in if you say anything they disagree with they will absolutely uh, pounce on you like you know the, the the conversation was in relation i think originally to a lot of bernie sanders supporters but especially a lot of male bernie sanders supporters who tended to um uh, just be you know cancel culture call out culture uh, which is a problem, I think, that even as somebody who is on the left like you, Mariam, um, as uh, I'm an uh, unabashed, unapologetic, unapologetic left liberal, I do find the woke, this woke thing problematic just because it's dogmatic. It's not that I don't share some of their positions. I think some of the causes that they have are very noble. Right? But uh, the problem is the way that you have the conversation. And you can't have a conversation with people who are just so adherent to dogma and they think that you know the, the way that they are is, is normal. But I have I don't think this capitulating to the woke, this is a trend. It's not something that's long lasting. These things come up, it's like an internet phenomenon. I don't really take it seriously. We should continue doing exactly what we're doing uh, without worrying about you know what this fringe group is gonna think or who we're capitulating I to. Mean, we're doing the right I thing. The, the, I have a problem with this whole criticism of social justice warriors. I, I think I'm someone who defends social justice and yeah. woke, uh, whatever. I kind of feel that um, as ex-Muslims, because we have been so, um, in a sense, um, we're faced with so much criticism from the pro-Islamist left. I mean what's called the regressive left. And I hate that term because I find, you know, there's this constant criticism of the left and a lot of excusing and legitimization of the far right. And I think part of why some ex-Muslims have fallen into this hole of trying to justify uh, that there is no police brutality, to quote some of them, that police brutality is a myth uh, and racism uh, in the police is a myth, I think is because, um, of this sort of constant attack on those who are on the left and a sort of legitimization and justification of the far right. And so, you know, I think the far right who are dogmatic, I think those ex-Muslims defending, you know, limited number of statistics without really listening or looking at the context of racism in the United States, in Britain and elsewhere, are being very dogmatic and not being very informed in their arguments. I, uh, I Yeah, I agree. I think that so, this is something... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to say that these terms, I think, is just, it, it's part of this, um, I think, I don't know, the part of uh, accepting a, a sort of far-right narrative that anyone on the left is dogmatic and we can't argue with them and they're woke and they're social justice warriors but Tommy Robinson's such a lovely old chap and <laughs> oh, Brex, it's just wonderful isn't it and Nigel Farage has a German wife have you heard it's just lovely you yeah. know it's that sort of thing where um yeah I, I, I see it as a, a really underhanded sly attack on the left um and just as a way of sort of discounting left arguments you know this is a I, and this is something that i've experienced i think there was a time when you know that and so when these terms come about it is problematic because when it came about it was a great term because it it actually encapsulated you know all of the uh, sort of the, the hypocritical uh, aspect of the left at the time right that was uh, turning a blind eye to a lot of this sort of islamic they had a double standard for uh, atrocities co committed under in, in Islam, um, but we're a long way from that. Now we've gone where the pendulum has swung the other way, and these a lot of these people who are called regressives are actually seen like they're rational in comparison, considering you know what we're seeing now on the other side. And mm -hmm. uh, and this is a problem with terms like that, you know, because woke right now actually legitimately applies to a lot of these sort of dogmatic leftists. And yes, there are even more dogmatic people on the far right. But eventually, 
what's going to happen is anytime you say anything that they disagree with, the people on the right disagree with, they're going to label you as woke because it's uh, derogatory. They're going to label you as regressive. The man who coined the term regressive left, Majid Nawaz, is considered regressive now by a lot of the uh, the far right types. So it's. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I don't think his politics is very progressive, to be honest. I mean, um, and I think that's not the point. Look, I guess I'm not making myself clear, but I do kind of think that there's a lot of hypocrisy on the right as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's uh, a lot of the support of uh, Islamism has come from right wing governments. Uh, the fact that uh, the United States foreign policy was instrumental in bringing Islamism to center stage during the Cold War. Um, uh, and the, the, their, their demand to create like a green Islamic belt around the Soviet Union at the time. The fact that, you know, the U.S., one of its closest allies is the Saudi government, despite any sorts of human rights violations that are going on. So what I want to say is that uh, there are various uh political uh perspectives that support islamism and various political perspectives that oppose it yeah. there are various political pr perspectives that are anti-racist and others who aren't and i think that uh, you know think about what your own perspective is i mean that's what i would um I would um, recommend because mm -hmm. i've heard ex-muslims for example argue that the islamists are Jumping on the bandwagon of Black Lives Matters in order to put forward their anti-Americanism, you know. Okay, yeah. but what's your perspective on Black Lives Matter? What's your perspective on police brutality and violence? You know, just because uh, Trump supports uh, the Iranian protest, not because he gives a damn about people in Iran, because look at his economic sanctions, look at U.S. military's role in that region for so many decades, the fact that the U.S. and the U.K. had a role in overthrowing a democratically elected government in 1950. Look at all of that. They don't give a damn about it. But just because Trump tweets in favor of Iranian protests, I'm not going to stop defending Iranian protesters. And just because Khamenei tweets in support of Black Lives Matters when they're killing people every day, including the state racism of Iran and its treatment of Afghan migrants in that country uh, and the brutality that they face every day uh, isn't going to stop me from defending Black Lives Matter. So what I, I guess my main point here is stop hiding for all of us. Stop hiding behind statistics. Stop hiding behind a different version of identity politics. Stop hiding behind what about re Defend your own politics. Mm -hmm. Stand you know, be clear about where your politics lies. Mine is very clear, you know, but yeah. I think for some people, it's not that clear. And I have heard even things that, you know, people are afraid to say that they're against Black Lives Matter because they'll lose their jobs. Look, everyone in power is speaking against, uh, in general, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, they say if they say um, there's racism against, um, they, they said that there's no racism against black people, they're going to lose their jobs. Look at all the things that Trump has said about black people, what he said about migrants. What you're saying is actually what the status quo says. So don't be so afraid. You're not afraid to burn the bar on. You're not afraid to uh, say you're an apostate when it's punishable by death, but you're afraid to oppose Black Lives Matter. You know, I think there's a level of dishonesty there, to be really frank, if we're going to put everything on the table. And I think that people are hiding behind things because for whatever reason, they don't want to come out with their politics, come out with your politics. And let's have a discussion where everything is on the table. Let's have a proper discussion. I'm going to keep pushing for people to support Black Lives Matter, to support an end to police violence, police brutality, state racism, uh, in the same way that I'm going to push for an end to blasphemy and positivity laws, I think they're linked. And I think it's important that we we see those links if we're going to move forward. You know, no movement can win in isolation. You can't win women's rights if men are against you. You can't win uh, ex-Muslim rights if no one is there fighting with you. You're the only ones talking about yourself, you know. Black Lives Matter has become a mass movement. We need to both support them, but also show them how our movements are linked, how our lives are linked, how our, our rights are linked. That's how change always comes about, you know, and I think that is key for me. Well said. 
Um, uh, and, you know, one other thing I added, you know, when you say hiding behind statistics, a lot of times the people who are quoting these studies are hiding behind selective statistics. Like there's nothing wrong with statistics, but you, you know, it, there is a, an element of confirmation bias as well. So again, there are links in the description uh, to um, Radley Balco's uh, sort of treasure trove of uh, studies, links to actual peer reviewed studies that are talking about systemic uh, racism and so on. So you can absolutely go through that um, at your own time. Uh, Faye, Faye Rahman is uh, asking, what do you think the BLM movement will amount to realistically? I mean, look, Faye, um, and I have to really do a shout out to Faye because I think, um, you know, she's very beautifully argued um, yeah. uh, in support of uh, Black Lives Matters and tried to unpack uh, a lot of the racism and the systematic racism that Black people face in, in the United States. So I really um, want to give her a shout out for that. I mean, I think that, look, no movement is guaranteed. If things were guaranteed, life would be simple, wouldn't it? We just, you know, sit, put our feet up and wait for women's liberation and gay liberation and the liberation of ex-Muslims and black people. I think movements uh, are what people make of it, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's really the change that uh, can practically come about. Movements can change the status quo, they can shift popular culture, they can uh, bring about rights that were just two days ago denied. And we see that now with the shift in the United States. The thing with social media and the internet is that we can see the shift not over decades, but over several days. I mean, it's not even, it's been more than two weeks only. And we are seeing people resign. We are seeing uh, changes in the police force. We are seeing Boris Johnson come and talk about how there needs to be a commission on inequality. We don't need another commission. Thank you very much, Boris Johnson. Uh, we need some action. But what I want to say is that it has forced them uh, to, uh, to take action. And I think that's what protest movements are about. It's forcing, very different from violence, but forcing change and action. And so in that sense, I think it will amount to a lot, but it does depend on us. And that's the difficult part because there are huge, um, both historical and real forces that are against a racial equality, I think, are against an end to police brutality. Because as I mentioned before, it, it's, it's a very useful tool, just like religion is a very useful tool, um, you know, and we've seen how yeah. useful it can be. Uh, and this whole idea of divide and rule, I think, you know, this whole idea of uh, multiculturalism, uh, which is really fundamentally, you know, the promotion of uh, um, 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 identity politics, this whole the, and the whole colonial policy of divide and rule. Also within our societies here in the West, there is this policy of divide and rule um, that we see. Uh, and so, I think movements like Black Light movements sort of um, help us see each other and go beyond those divisions and see our common humanity. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I want to read you a quote of someone. Um, there's this woman who, um, gosh, it's such a beautiful quote. And I really wanted to, well, we can keep talking. And if I can find it. Sure. I'm going to read it to you. Yeah, I and I'll, I'll just, uh, I had a couple of things just, well, we covered some of this before also, Faye, uh, but usually when you want to see a movement, do, what a movement does and what it amounts to, a lot of times when you can really appreciate it in retrospect, mm -hmm. uh, in some cases yeah. you can see what's happening now, but to people who are in the thick of it, the chaos yeah. and the anger and, you know, on one side is just focusing on the looting of the statues, the looting of the statues, what's happening? But, you know, on the other hand, when you, as, as Mariam saying, that there are officials resigning. The qualified immunity, uh, you're challenging qualified immunity and possibly overturning, overturning it. There is talk about disbanding these police unions. Um, mm -hmm. There is, uh, you know, the NASCAR flying Confederate flags. I don't know why I keep coming back to that, but that yeah. absolutely blew my mind when I saw it. Um, well, these are things that you're seeing. They're, they're very real. Um, 
it's it's becoming it, it, it seems like it, this is something that is more sustainable uh, mm -hmm. i think it was obama who was saying that again that he saw more progress in this in the last uh, few weeks than he's ever seen in his entire lifetime uh, which is incredible and then again you know as as Mariam's talking about the effects in the uk they they are the effects pretty much all over the world you know, with the black lives matter movement so i think realistically uh, you're going to see a lot of these core issues being addressed in a better way of course there's still going to be some residual element that you know future generations are going to take on but I, I actually think that what's happening right now is very significant. And mm -hmm. um, again, when when you are in the thick of it, when you're in the middle of it, everything seems like it's on an equal plane. But ultimately, in the long term, and I, I wrote about this on Facebook 10 years from now, when you're at a NASCAR race, for whatever reason, uh, and you're sitting there and, and they're celebrating the 10th anniversary of when they banned Confederate flags, that's when you're gonna appreciate it. That's when your kids will actually understand that okay, wow, something really happened. Um, that's when, at that point, you know, all of the other skirmishes and the distractionary elements are not going to be a factor in it. Mm. Uh, here, I found the quote. It's it's from a, a Guardian columnist, um, and she's a, a feminist, and she talks about right now in this uprising. That is where the counterintuitive but constructive answer is forming, we are encountering each other in our shared and forced encounters with the police. Mm -hmm. The building can start from there. There is no shortcut. We must find one another on the streets. And yeah. I am, you know, I am a believer of street action, direct action. I think nothing changes uh, unless we, we come out in this way. Uh, and so I, I do think it can amount to great things. I think it's already amounted to something just with the shift that we're seeing in such a short time, but how great that shift is gonna be and how fundamental that's gonna be, I think is really good to depend on all of us. And that's why I think it's important for us to have these conversations and to try, I mean, my, my position is to try and get as many ex Muslims on board as possible. It's not going to yeah. be everyone, of course, and uh, but but you know I think it's important that we try. Right. What message do you have to uh, ex-Muslims who are uh, who you want to? Because I mean, obviously, we can fight among each other. I've seen some really vicious arguments happening between ex-Muslims as well, uh, which is really not convincing anybody one way or, or another. But uh, what message? What message do you have to ex-Muslims who are watching this and uh, disagree with you or think that you know you're uh, too left on this or too whatever um, criticism. Well, I'm definitely too left on everything. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's fine. I want open borders, you know, whatever. Um, but I think, look, I think fundamentally this is about politics and we're not a collective. You know, I don't agree with uh, homogenous communities. I don't agree on placing collective blame or collective guilt or any of that. And I think mm -hmm. that we are not a collective. We don't have group thoughts and group uh rights and all of that we are individuals i will take responsibility for my uh, uh you know my actions uh, and my politics and where i stand history judges all of us uh you mm -hmm. know uh, and that's not for us to judge but i think um you know for me i think this is where we need to stand you know and so uh there are going to be people who don't agree that's their politics you know i think that just I think it is buying into white nationalist identity politics. I think it is buying into white nationalism um, by refusing to recognize police, uh, uh, systematic police uh, racism and brutality and all the other things that, that we've discussed and that come with it. Um, and we all make our own decisions and choices, you know, and it's fine, We're, we will argue, um, that is the reality of politics and you know fundamentally uh change happens in that way by discussing by talking by arguing of course uh, it's tense because these are life and death issues for a lot of people you know and uh, just like the ex-muslim um debate is a matter of life and death for a lot of people and so it is polarized and i think any any movement that is worth anything will polarize because you sort of it does um you are going to have people who uh won't agree and 
and and they won't agree vehemently because they're so fundamental the issues that are being addressed you know and so right. i sort of think yeah we're we're on our own in a sense but i see myself on my own but part of a very large movement and most probably uh, they do too but i wonder how honest some are about what movement they're standing with you know and i, yeah. I don't want to use my words that's really what i think if, if i'm completely honest that this is a position that is not a position um that we should be taking but yeah. that's my that's my opinion okay um and I, so thank you again for coming on. We're at exactly two hours. So I'm gonna, I know that there were uh, a couple of more questions. I looked through them and it, some of them were things that we'd already addressed, like, you know, about the statues and so on. So, but I have a feeling there's going to be some response to this. So hopefully uh, we can keep this discussion going and, you know, have you back on uh, to do it because I, this, this time just flew past, so. Yeah, um, great. Thank you so much for um, having me and giving the space for this conversation. I think it's really important. Thanks yeah. to all the people who struggle through, <laughs> yeah. through it for two hours. It's really good to uh, have you all here. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see each other on the front lines, hopefully yeah. on the right side of the front lines. <laughs> or the left the side. Or no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thank so thanks everybody who joined Bye. in thanks everybody for listening i think that there's going to be more viewership of this also afterwards so this is going to i just want to say that the video is going to be up in perpetuity on youtube and on facebook uh, this is also going to come out as an audio podcast um uh, on itunes and all the other podcast forums uh, and in addition to that some of the links that we talked about uh, some of the studies that we talked about they're all in the description uh, so I've made note of that. So please do uh, check that out. And if you have any qu any questions, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, send them to me. Send them to us. And uh, we'd be totally happy to do this again and talk about it some more. But thank you very much, Maria. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Just stay on for just a second. I'm going to end the broadcast.